All right, Dr. Rob, how do you feel about relying on two-dimensional radiographs only for placing dental implants? Well, I feel like using two-dimensional radiography for placing dental implants is like doing dentistry with one hand and the other hand tied behind your back. And the way you can you know, make an analogy here is it's very simple to think about uh, two-dimensional radiography as leaving off one dimension. So at, at, at best, you only have 66% of the information, okay? It gets even worse than that because two-dimensional radiography is a projection. So it's a projection of a curved object onto a flat surface. And so we know about like the globe. When you see the globe, Greenland is bigger or smaller than it really is. On a, on a, on a two-dimensional map, it looks huge, right? And then you look at it on the, on the sphere, on the globe, and it's small. And you go, wow, what's going on here? Well, that's what happens when you take a three-dimensional object and you project it into a two-dimensional world. Now, we don't live in a 2D world. We live in a 3D world. And in some cases with time, you would call it 4D. But the point is, is that if I live in a 3D world and I do surgery in a 3D world, wouldn't it be nice to plan in 3D? And it's just a simple, like, I like to keep things simple in my mind. And so if I can plan in 3D, I don't incur those spatial distortions. And that allows me to virtually place a dental implant or do a virtual surgery to get an implant in the idealized prosthodontic position so that I minimize risk and improve outcomes for my patient probably for the rest of their life. And so I think that two-dimensional radiography is very, very dangerous. The other thing about it is this. If you draw conclusions about treatment modality based on two-dimensional radiography, you, you, you run the risk of incorporating the spatial dimensional error. In other words, if you were going to do a comparison over time of bone around an implant, you would make a radiographic jig. And the radiographic jig would ensure that your coordinate system is consistent from the first radiograph to the placement radiograph to the healed radiograph to the five years later to the 10 years later so that all your radiographs are from the same position, same angle. Because the minute you start to change the angle, if you're measuring things that are below a millimeter, you're, you're distorting the bone and or teeth around the implant. And so we, we learned that in dental school, we had the slob rule, uh, S-L-O-B, same side, lingual, opposite side, buckle. And the idea was that with a two-dimensional radiograph, if you took a second radiograph from a different angle, you could determine whether or not the object in the radiograph was on the lingual or the buckle of said given other anatomical landmark. So that's how we used two two-dimensional radiographs to determine what was really happening in 3D space when that's all we had available to us. Well, we don't have that problem anymore. And thus, if we've got data in the, in the field that was predicated off of two-dimensional radiographs and they didn't use a radiographic jig, then I would call that data into question. I would say it's the outcomes that you're drawing from this two-dimensional data is questionable. It's questionable, right? Because we don't know. The other thing is, is that when you take a two-dimensional radiograph and you smush it down, you, you're not getting the, the content that's in the inside. So pretty much every one of us has gone to a sales pitch for, you know, buy a 3D, you know, a 3D scanner, a, a cone beam CT scanner, where they'll show you a picture of a, of a PA of a tooth. And you'll see nothing on it. You'll say, I see nothing. Everybody in the room goes, I see nothing. And then they show a three-dimensional radiograph, and they show that there's an apical radiolucency that's sandwiched between the two cortical plates that doesn't show up on a bite wing. It doesn't show up on a PA, rather. But it's clear as day, right there, as clear as day when you look at it in the three-dimensional radiography. And so when you look at that, you say to yourself, wow, that's really powerful, and that's, that's a selling feature, and we do it all the time. So we, we use it all the time. We say, hey, this PA doesn't look good. Let's go back to the, the three-dimensional data and see if we see something. And then we see a lesion there and we go, wow, there it is. And so using that 3D data is super, super helpful. I couldn't do dentistry without it. I, I Literally, if someone said, I'm going to take your cone beam CT scan away, I'd be like, that's, that's just malpractice. I can't do dentistry without it. I use it that much. And I use it for everything, right? I mean, I, it's not only just implant planning, but I use it for, for everyday work. We, we now have it incorporated with our Itero, with our uh, virtual planning with Itero for orthodontics to make sure you're not blowing out the buccal bone with too much orthodontic movement. You know, it's just amazing. So using it is powerful, but I would caution people that if you are building um, guidelines and rules for implant placements off of two-dimensional radiography, be very, very careful. Not that it can't be done. So be, be, I want to be clear about this. It's not that it can't be done. 
It's just that you need to understand the limitations that come from the distortions and not accurately taking the radiographs from the same exact perspective every time to form a conclusion might be called into question. So just be careful that you're not building your whole your whole house on a shaky foundation. Absolutely. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.